everyone, welcome to the series called The Talk of the Table, where we're getting away from small talk and we're getting to the meat of the matter. Real, powerful conversations that can change your world. In this episode, we're gonna talk about how you can share your faith with other people or how you can understand faith in a deeper way. We hope that this talk will have an impact on you. I wanna invite you to stay to the end where I have some more information for you. And before you log off, don't forget to go to branchlife.church to fill out your connection card. We'd love to connect with you. Thanks for joining us today. Enjoy this episode. Well, I want to thank Chris and Kaylin for uh, sharing their news with us, and they will be moving in about four weeks, and the, the last Sunday that they're with us, we're going to pray over them and do a sending service for them, and uh, their goal is to be on the mission field somewhere around 2025 and 2026, and the church that they're going to knows this and are fully supporting that, so uh, we are excited to see that team expand, and as Chris said, we're going to be emphasizing all through the month of August different ways that we can partner together and be better together as we see incredible momentum moving into the fall and actually adding some stuff to our programming. So the team that Chris mentioned was our tech team. We need four to five new technicians. No experience necessary, we'll train you guys. Couples can serve together, men, women, young, old. That's a great place to attend and serve at the same time. And if you would be interested in doing that, letting us know on your connection card is the place to start. But we're gonna be talking about the kids' teams, we're gonna be talking about Parker's greeting, uh, small groups, all kinds of things where you can step in and serve as often as you can. Uh, whether it's every week or every month, or several times a year. Uh, we believe that all of us have been gifted by God to serve in some way. So start praying about how you can serve. And if you're just ready to raise your hand and say, plug me in, put, put it on the card and we'll contact you and get in touch with you and, and be excited about that. Chris and Kaylin serve in a lot of areas. They serve in the cafe on Sunday nights. Obviously, Chris is our host and, and on the prayer team and small group leaders. So we're going to need help in all of those areas. So Let's keep covering that in prayer. One of our greatest uh, statements that we stay here at Branch all the time, and this applies to all of us and all of our families, God will give you exactly the resources you need to do exactly what he wants you to do. And so we're really excited to see how God's providing and what he's going to ask us to do. So don't miss August 13th. We're going to give you more in that Sunday night time together and uh, go over some exciting news and, and talk about not only the short term, but the midterm and the long-term vision for where we're going together as a church. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can probably skip ahead. We're going to jump around a little bit, but we'll be in Matthew chapter 5 shortly. So you can start moving ahead there. As we are in the middle of our table talk series, we have been talking over the last three weeks about the talk itself. What do we mean by the talk? The talk about faith. How do you share your faith? We use this resource uh, turning everyday conversations into gospel conversations. We put these books out last week. I don't know. Uh, there was 25, 30 of them. They all disappeared except for a few more downstairs, which is awesome news. So if you want one of these, there's still a few down at the Connection Center. Grab one, first come, first serve, or order it on Amazon. You will not regret going over that. That will review everything that we've been talking about. For the rest of August, we're actually going to talk about all the pieces that come before and after the talk. And here's, here's the idea. Our plan, our goal is that through this summer, we would have 100 table talks, and a table talk is any intentional conversation about faith. Someone asked me this morning, what if it happened over text messaging? Yes, it totally counts, right? Anytime you intentionally share your faith, that is a table talk. Our goal is 100. We're somewhere north of 30 that have ha happened already just through the month of July, and we're so excited about all of those things. So through the rest of August, we're hoping to get the reports in to meet our 100 table goal. And how's that going for you? Are you excited about it? Have you been praying about it? Have you been aiming to have at least one of these table talk conversations where you can share your faith? We're going to talk about different components through the month of August. And we're answering this question. 
first we're saying, well, what if this actually happens? What if there's a hundred table talks? What if each one of us leads someone to Jesus and, the, and God starts seeing the increase? That would be amazing to see friends and family members respond to the invitation of the gospel. And that's awesome to think about, but let me ask it in a different way. What if you invite someone over for a table talk and what if they actually say yes? Now what do you do, right? <laughs> You're like, I didn't think you'd say yes. I was kind of hoping you'd be like, nah, maybe next year, right? What if you actually end up hosting one of these table talks? They say yes to the invitation. They say yes to hanging out and going for a walk. They say yes to coming over for dinner. What do you do? You might then ask yourself the question, well, what's the agenda? And today we're going to talk about the agenda. We're going to talk about the plan. When you have, are having an intentional table talk, an agenda, an agenda is important. When I was in um, uh, student government in college, we had our mentor, our class mentor, and he, he, was, he saw me lead a couple of meetings, and then he took me out to lunch, and he said, Josh, uh, seems like you're leading these meetings and you don't have a plan. And I was like, well, yeah, you're probably right about that. <laughs> you're just winging it. He goes, have you ever heard of an agenda? And I'm like, ooh, agendas. Nobody likes agendas. He's like, I'm not talking about ulterior motives. I'm talking about a plan for the meeting. How's it going to start? What items are you going to cover? What are the takeaways, the action items that people will have? And he said, you, you really need to have an agenda. And that's going to totally transform your meetings, right? And all of us love meetings. And so he bought me a notepad, a personal, personalized notepad, where I would then be able to plan out an agenda for the meetings that I was leading when I was a senior in college. And ever since, I was like, wow, agendas make a big difference. And we do agendas all the time. And we do agendas in different ways. How many of you have ever gone on a vacation with someone who likes schedules, right? Raise your like they like them like they got we're going on vacation and at eight o'clock we're getting up and at nine o'clock we're eating and at ten o'clock we're going to be on the beach Ten thirty sharp we're going to be in the water and then we're going to play paddle ball right they get everything all gended out and some people love that other people are like let's go on vacation what's the plan i don't know right and that and and that can sort of be an agenda we're leaving a lot of free time on purpose to figure out where it goes but at some point we're going to have lunch at some point we're at dinner right you have a plan and we do these schedules, we do these agendas, and they help us get through the conversation. When you're having someone over for a table talk, your agenda, somewhere on your agenda is you want to talk about faith, because that's what a table talk is. If you're having someone over to sing karaoke, guess what you're going to do at some point? Sing karaoke, right? It's on your agenda. And some of you should never have a karaoke party, right? That shouldn't be what you do. If you're going to have a game night, you're going to play games. If you're going to have a movie night, you're going to watch movies, right? And you kind of got to have a plan. When you're hosting a table talk, remember, it's an intentional conversation about faith. You want to have a conversation about faith at some point in your agenda. And here's the thing. Here's what you don't want to have happen. Your friends come over. You go out to dinner. You're going on a walk. And you say, you know what? I'd like to talk to you about faith. And they go, wait, What? Why? I didn't know we were going to talk about faith. How? Oh, oh! Well now I'm nervous, right? You don't, you don't want that to happen. That's, it's not a bait and switch. It's not like I got you over for a game night. Now let's talk about religion, right? We're not doing that kind of thing. From the get-go, we should be setting our table talks up in a way that the conversation about faith is never a surprise. We don't want the conversation about faith to be a surprise. Yes, sometimes there are opportunities we didn't anticipate. That's different. But there's, there is a way to have your life structured, even your table talk structured, so that your agenda is never a surprise. Now, here's four reasons our agenda should never be a surprise. And we're going to cover these four reasons quickly because we got baptism coming up in just a couple of minutes. The first reason our agenda should never be a surprise is simply this. Our agenda should be plain for all to see. Our agenda should be plain for all to see. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 is the Sermon on the Mount. 
fantastic sermon, right? Jesus, most famous sermon ever preached. Jesus gives it. He starts with the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit. He ends with the story about building your house on the rock and not on the sand because the storms are coming. Pretty awesome. If you haven't read through the Sermon on the Mount in a while, do that. Several years ago, we did a series called The Good Life. You can check that out online. But in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 13, Jesus says these famous words. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? If it's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put it on a stand and it gives light to the entire house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may See your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Matthew chapter 5 is declaring the statement that you are the light of the world. Your agenda should not be a surprise because your life should reflect the fact that you love God. Your life should demonstrate day in and day out that you have the joy of the Lord, the peace that passes understanding, and a hope for eternity. Your, your life should represent the fact that your house is built upon the rock, and he gives you strength and power to get through every day. Your Christian faith should be as plain as the words on my t-shirt. And how many of us would, our, would if we told our friend, we brought him over to dinner, and we said, you know what? I'm a Christian, they would go, no, you're not. I don't believe that for a second, right? You never want that to be the case. And, and just like this verse says, so many of us, we have the light of salvation, but we tend to put it under a basket. I have, a, I have my iPhone here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to admit something embarrassing to you. I know this hack, right? If you swipe down on your iPhone and then you want the flashlight to come on, you have this icon right here. Now, ever since that icon has existed, and this can be three or four or five years since that icon's been there, all of my phones have been broken. Because I tap the icon and nothing would happen. And I tap it and nothing would happen. And I tap it and nothing would happen. And just a couple weeks ago, I said to my friend, I said, my flashlight icon does not work. And they're like, are you tapping it? I'm like, yeah. They're like, press it. And I went, what? <laughs> and if you, if you put your finger on it and you, you, just, you just press it, oh, snap. Come on, iPhone. Oh, yep. It goes on. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> I thought it might, it didn't, look, it works, right? Like, there's a way that this happens, and now, now it's working with a tap. I don't know what's going on with my phone, right? And the, the light actually comes on. And when you walk around, have you ever seen it where someone has a light in their pocket, and you're like, hey, flashlight's on? That's, a, that's what a lot of us do. We either, we either don't press in to our Christian light, or we hide it, we keep it in our pocket, and we start, we start to say to other people, yeah, Christianity is something that I do, but it's not what, something I want other people to see. It's, it's, not, it's not something that you know, really makes a difference in my life. But when we press into the light, the light starts to shine. Do you know the difference between watts and lumens? Watts is the amount of energy coming in. Look, the light's on. I can't get it off. The, watts are the amount of energy coming into the light bulb, and the lumens is the brightness, Right? Now, at my house, I like the light bulbs that are bright and white. When I turn on the lights, I like to go like this. <sighs> right? Like, turn them all on. I want to see the lights. I want to brighten here. My wife likes the warm yellow lights. She likes it to be softer and a little bit more neutral. So when she changes the light bulbs, we get a warm, you know, light tone. <laughs> When she asks me to change the light bulbs, I'll run to Home Depot and I'll look at the watts and I'll be like, 100, that can't be enough. 
150, 2,000 lumens, that's the one I want, right, right? I'm going to get that one. So I get these bright lights, and in our bedroom right now, the last light I changed was our ceiling fan light. And right now, when you come in our bedroom, if you hit the light on the side, this ambiance light comes up. If you hit the light by the bathroom and turn on the fan, it's like super bright. It's like, wow. She never turns that light on. <laughs> that always stays off. For so many of us as Christians, we, we want to have like the warm chilling effect. We just, we just kind of want, we want to show up and we don't want to make a big difference. Like, you know, don't notice me, you know. Leave me to my cell, and that's, that's all I, no, you know, you know what God says? You're supposed to be the 150 watt, 2,000 lumen bulb that when you come in the room, everyone goes, wow, it's bright in here. Something's happening. Something's changed. There's something about your life that's stamped on your forehead. It's in your personality. It's the way that you, that you carry yourself. It's the hope and the faith that you have that makes a huge difference in the world, and that light should be blinding. And do you know what's brighter than one 150 watt, 2,000 lumen bulb? Two 150 watt lumen bulbs, right? What if husband and wife were on fire for Jesus? What if all the kids, what if the entire small group, what if the whole church was lighting up an entire community, right? That's the plan. A city on a hill cannot be hid, right? And when we bring the lights together, it should be obvious that your faith is in Jesus and that you have something that's special. I went to a wedding and a funeral yesterday. It was a long day. And at the funeral, we talk, a friend of mine growing up passed away. He's a, a, a granddad, and his grandkids got up, and they talked about their granddad, and they talked about his work ethic, and they talked about how he spent time with each and every one of them. He talked about the life lessons that they learned, and every single one of those grandkids said, you know what you couldn't miss about my dad? He loved Jesus. He followed Jesus. And you know how he loved Jesus? He would spend time every single day helping a neighbor, helping a friend, going the extra mile. He would spend all day at work, and he'd drag us with us. We'd come home, we'd eat dinner, we thought we were down for the night. He'd be like, no, kids, come on, we're going to go deliver meals to some of our neighbors. And they'd go take food. So every single one of the kids told stories about how granddad was always getting them to come with him to do something extra for someone else. That's a bright light. That's someone who's thinking about how I can light up the world around me. And our agenda should never be a surprise because people should first and foremost see our light. Before we ever say a word, when people see you, they should know what you're all about. When people see you, they should know what you're all about. Would it be a surprise if you gave your friends a pop quiz and you asked them the question, what am I all about? Would they say they're all about Jesus? When they talk to you at your, about you at your funeral service and they tell you about, tell all the rest of us about your life, are they going to end with this thing that says, the most important thing to my pop-pop, the most important thing to my brother, the most important thing to my mom or my sister or my neighbor was that they loved Jesus. It should be obvious as the words on my shirt. You see, John Maxwell says it this way, the message that I give is the message that I live. The message that I give is the message that I live. And we can talk to you all about the three circles, God's design, sin broke the world. We must repent and believe in the gospel. It's the only way to heal the brokenness. And then we pursue and rest in Christ as we go back towards his design. We can talk about that over and over again. And you can say it with your words, but if you don't live it with your life, it's empty. The most powerful testimony that you can give is a life that lives out the message that you share. And so you, yes, have to be living for Christ. It's not perfection, it's a pursuit. How bright is your light? Are you tapping every now and then on the iPhone, or are you pressing in? Are you letting it be as bright as possible, or are you keeping it dim? Let's go all in for Christ and see what he does. The second reason our agenda should never be a surprise is our agenda is something we should always be talking about. 
Our agenda is something we should be always be talking about. What, what is our agenda? What should we be talking about? We should be talking about the gospel. We should be talking about how God has changed our lives. We should be talking about the difference that Jesus makes in our lives. Not just around a table when we're sharing our faith, but every day as we go through this world, the conversation that is regular in our mouth, that is regular in our words, should include our faith in God. Why, should, why do I know this? This is an absolute fact. You can write it down and you can keep it on your refrigerator. You talk about what you love. Amen? You talk about what you love. And if you love God, you're going to talk about God. He's going to come up on a regular basis. I love when I meet Christians who love to talk about God. And to me, they're strangers. But you know within the first, I don't know, five, ten minutes of the interaction that they love God. There was a lady in Pottstown, we were doing some food servicing, and we were putting food out, and she was helping do the table, and I'd never met her before, and, and she came up to me, and she saw me kind of putting the food out and doing my thing, and she said, thank you for that, and, and we were having a conversation, and, and, and I mean, probably within three minutes, she goes, so do you love Jesus? <laughs> I'm like, yes, I do, do you? She's like, yes, I do, right? We had this great conversation. She immediately talked about faith, because she's like, I, I just got to talk about Jesus, she ends up, she used to be the mayor of Pottstown. We just had an awesome, awesome connection. To this day, we're Facebook friends. Why? Because immediately she, talk, she talked to me about what she loved. And there are some of us that if we would say, the what do, you, what do you love, right? Well, let's just look at what you talked about this last month and this last week. And if we could take a list, right, of what I talked about most, what would be on the top of your list? I, I want you to think about it. Maybe think about it for your spouse. <laughs> what does your husband talk about most? What does your wife talk about most? What do your kids talk about most? And what would be on that list? Are you making one in your brain? You know what's on the top of my list? This is shameful. Me. <laughs> I talk about me all the time. People say, how are you doing? I'm glad you're asked. Let me give you a conversation about myself, right? And we start talking about me. For so many of us, we love to talk about me. And we just talk about me over and over and over and over and over again. Let me give you a pro tip. It's pretty awesome when you talk about someone else other than yourself. Ask a question about how they're doing. How their day's going. Where, what's going on at their job. Some people love work, and so they talk all about work. Some people, some people love games, so they talk all about games. Some people like the Eagles, so they talk all about the Eagles, right? And we have these conversations about what we love. If we love God, God would be able to come up in our conversation and should be high on our list. It shouldn't be abnormal or unusual that around the dinner table you talk about what God is showing you and what God is teaching you. My wife is a good example of this. She, she, um, she's been reading Nehemiah. Nehemiah is going to be our next book study, and she has the inside track on that. And she, she was kind of reading ahead and doing her thing. You know, three times I've caught her talking to a friend about the book of Nehemiah. She says something like, I was reading Nehemiah the other day, and this came up, and man, it really encouraged me, and it sounds like it's something that would encourage you. She, she did it to me. She did it when she was talking to her sister. She did it when she was talking to her, her mom. I've heard her, I, and I've overheard her do it a, a bunch of times. Why would she do that? Because she loves God. She loves to talk about what God is doing and what God's teaching her. She loves to tell people about Branch. She loves to invite people to Branch. She loves to pray for people to come to Branch. Why? Because she loves God's church. And it becomes what she talks about. My dad posted on Facebook yesterday. Uh, Facebook told me this morning that it was 11 hours ago. And I screenshot it as I was praying through the service today. And let me just read his post for you today. It says, we, we appreciate the, an army of prayer warriors who would be interceding or praying for Betty Jean, my mom, as she continues her radiation treatments for the skin cancer on her legs. The treatments are at Penn Cancer Center near Valley Forge, and BJ has just finished 20, uh, round 20 of 25 rounds on her left leg. The side effects are significant, and after 10 rounds, we stopped due to swelling and burning skin and pain. And there was a boil-like growth on her leg. I'm sorry, this is getting pretty disgusting at this point. The doctor decided that we should start the rest of the 25. The doctor will decide when we do the next 25 rounds on her right leg. Our prayer is victory over cancer. This is what he's asking for. Limited side effects. And 
opportunities to share the gospel to the cancer center staff and fellow patients. We are blessed by the ladies from our, from our Branch Life small groups who drive her to the cancer center, who also have provided meals. And God has been so good to BJ as she battles cancer. Being a part of the family of God is a great honor and blessing. Amen. Now here's what's fascinating about that conversation on Facebook. Yes, is there something serious going on that's hard? Absolutely. And we're talking about it. But where did they quickly change the conversation to? We're praying for victory over cancer, and we're praying for the spread of the gospel. Why? Because cancer is giving us a new opportunity to connect with people we would have never connected to before. And maybe God wants to use the cancer to spread the gospel at the cancer hospital and with other people who are facing cancer. I've heard my dad dozens of times, dozens of times, sit down with people who had got a cancer diagnosis. He sits down with them, he prays about their cancer, and dozens of times he said to them, now listen, God may open doors for you to share your faith while you have this cancer battle. And dozens of times I went in my heart, Dad, come on, they're dealing with cancer. Let's just show them love. But does he ultimately practice what he preaches? Now, now they're facing cancer. Now they're facing a storm. And where do his words go? His words go to the gospel. He can't help but talk about God during the storm. He can't help but talk about God during the good days. You can't help but talk about God around the meal or on vacation or around the fireplace. Why? Because you talk about the things that you love. And when you love God, you're going to talk about God. When you love his church, you're going to talk about his church. Look at these verses. Acts 18 verse 9 says this. The Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. Paul, don't be scared. Go on speaking and do not be silent. It should be something, it's a command that we speak up about our faith. In Acts chapter 4, verse 20, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. When you have seen Jesus, when you fall in love with Jesus, when you've seen the power of Jesus, you have to talk about Jesus, right? Did you guys see the big game last night? Did you watch that last touchdown? Wasn't it unbelievable? Wasn't it crazy? It was so amazing. I can't shut up about it. How much more about Jesus? Have you met Jesus? Do you hear that he died on the cross for us? That he's healing brokenness in this world? That I can have life and life everlasting because God, the heavenly father, sent his son to save me, to make me a part of the family of God. I can't stop talking about it. And Paul, of all people, Paul, who was a persecutor, Paul, who was someone going after Christians, now has to tell everybody about God who changed his life. Our agenda should never be a surprise because it should not be unusual to anyone in our lives that we love to talk about God. In John chapter 4, verse 28, 29, and 39, it says, it talks to us about the woman at the well. The woman at the well left her water jar and she went away from the town and she said, she talked to the people, come and see the man who told me all that I ever, ever did. Can this be the Christ? The woman at the well lived a horrible life. She lived a pagan life. She lived an adulterous life. She was somebody who was outcast by her community. But Jesus Christ came into her life and transformed it in the moment, gave her a drink from the living well, and her life changed instantly when she met Christ. And what did she do in that very moment? She went out and said to the people, come and see this man that I met. Come and see this Christ who is life-changing. She couldn't shut up about it. And many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony, because of her witness, because of her words. They came to see Jesus. He told me, he told me all that I ever did. He's the one that's changed my life. He's the one that saved me. When we have met Jesus, we have to tell other people about it. It's too exciting not to. 
Have you met Jesus? Have you ever had a personal relationship with Jesus that was life-changing, so much so that you couldn't stop talking about him? Maybe you've been a part of a church for a long time. Maybe you've heard about faith or religion for a long time, but you've never had this passion about Jesus that I'm talking about. You've never had this like life-changing, can't keep it quiet, got to turn the light on my iPhone on experience. And you want to say, I, I don't think I've known that Jesus. I mean, I just go to church because that's what my family does. Someone told me I should. But you're telling me that I can meet someone that's going to change my life in such a way that I can't stop talking about it? Yeah, that's Jesus. That's Jesus. And maybe the reason it's easy for you to be silent about faith is because you've never actually met Jesus. And he, you haven't allowed him to change your life. Maybe for you, today's the day where you say, you know what? I want to know this Jesus. I want to meet the Savior. I want him to do for me what he did for the woman at the well. I want my life to change. I want a light that shines. I want to speak about the excitement that I have in knowing Jesus. Well, today I want to invite you into a personal relationship with God. God loves you. He designed this world with perfect love and with perfect peace. And this world broke because of our sin. And there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. The Bible asks us to repent and believe. God, I'm sorry for my sins. And I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me and rose again. That's amazing. And if you'll put your faith and trust in Jesus today, today I want to introduce you to the life-changing Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. In this very moment, you can bow your head and close your eyes. You can bow your heart and, and pray silently to God. Ask him for forgiveness of your sins. Tell him you believe. And the Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. And I tell you what, when you're saved, you won't be able to stop talking about it. If you have any questions about your faith, we encourage you to go to the gospel tab. You can scan the QR code here. And after the service, our prayer teams will be available to talk with you. Any of those things can help you go further in your faith. And here's, here's the truth about it, brothers and sisters. Once you've met Jesus, it should be much harder to shut up than speak up. Or, I said that wrong. It should be much harder to shut up than not speak up. It should be much harder to stay quiet than it was to be say it loud about your faith. Now quickly, the third reason about our faith is simply this. The third reason our agenda should not be a surprise is our agenda is nothing to be ashamed of. Our agenda is nothing to be ashamed of. And let me tell you what's going to happen to you when you become a Christian, when you decide to follow Jesus, is the world around you is going to pressure you to say, that's not cool. They're going to, they're going to come and put a, a, a clap, they're going to try to rain on your parade. And the world is going to tell you this message that being a Christian is something you should hide, that being a Christian is somehow wrong, that being a Christian is somehow fringe. And that you should not be proud about your Christianity. That that should be something that you should keep to yourself. It's your faith and your faith alone. As, as a matter of fact, the, the percentages of people that say that it's okay to share your faith is at the lowest level ever. Why? Because the world keeps telling us to be quiet about our faith. That to be, to be a Christian is somehow less than. And I want to tell you right here and right now that you have no reason to be ashamed about your faith. You have no reason not to take complete pride in the fact that you are a son or daughter of the king. In Romans chapter 1, in verse 16, it says, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and also to the Greek. And the beautiful thing about faith is that it is open to everyone, everywhere, and every time. No matter where you come from, no matter the color of your skin, no matter the amount of money in your bank account, no matter your past history, no matter the choices that you made, no matter if you're in prison or you're free, you are welcomed to believe and become a part of the family of God. And I am proud of the gospel. I am proud of the word of God. I am proud to be a part of the family of God. I am proud that I am a part of a church that knows and loves God. I am proud of all of those things. I am not ashamed to be a Christian. And I never want to hide that under a bushel. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, it says our hope is, right? Our hope is, it's not politics. 
Our hope is not finances. Our hope is not a great marriage. Our hope is not the best job in the world. Our hope is that your faith continues to grow and that our sphere of activity among you will greatly expand so that we can preach the, the gospel in the regions around you. One of the things that I'm so thankful for that God is doing is he is expanding his church. Many people say, no, the church is dying. Have you been to Branch Life? Have, have you seen now, after today, almost 20 baptisms in six weeks? Are you seeing the, the growth that's happening? And listen, let me tell you, we're not the only ones. It's happening all over our region. It's happening all over our country. It's happening all over our world in places like Iraq and China and Korea and South Korea. The church is exploding. God is on the move. And he's asked us to say, let's pray about this amazing opportunity to take this gospel that we're proud of and spread it beyond our regions. Let's go further with our faith and reach more people. That's, that's the goal. That's the vision. That's the, where the excitement is. But let's, let, let's the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. It's not me. It's not you. It's God. God is on the move in our day and age. And I am proud. I am so proud to be a part of the family of God. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Now listen, there are a lot of Christians out there or Christians who have given Christianity a bad name. And that can cause us to shrivel away. I saw a postcard at the beach and it said, I love the Lord, but some of his kids annoy me. <laughs> right? So, sometimes we can mess it up. Sometimes we can get the wrong thing in the wrong place. And, and listen, there's been a lot of things that have happened in the name of Jesus that Jesus wants nothing to do with. And our job as Christians is not to then go hide in the corner. It's to bear the light of Jesus' true name. To love God and love our neighbor and to be proud of that. It is absolutely okay to be excited about being a Christian. It is absolutely okay to be excited about being a Christian. Amen? Let's go. Let's go. Let's go spread the light. I love our faith. And number four, our agenda should be clear in our invitation. Our agenda should be clear in our invitation. Jesus gave us this example. Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and calling, uh, throwing a net into the sea. For they were fishermen, and they said to them, he said to them, follow me, that's the invitation, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call you to follow me, and I'm going to let you know what the plan is. When you follow me, you're going to be used to reach people for Jesus. Follow Christ and see what God is going to do. Jesus called, uh, went to Galilee, he called Philip and said to him, follow me. And Philip immediately found Nathan, Nathaniel, and said to him, come and see this Jesus. When you invite someone over to your house for a table talk, your invitation should include the fact that you want to talk about faith. Your invita invitation to say to them, hey, come over for dinner, let's sing some karaoke, and at some point I want to tell you a little bit about my faith. I want to talk about faith. And that's an awesome thing to do right off the bat. Why? Because if you say you're going to talk about faith, you're more likely to talk about it. And be ready to say to someone, I, I want to see God do in your life what he did in my life. And I'd love to tell you what God has done in my life. And when you put the invitation out and you say, hey, let's go for a walk. I want to, I want to tell you about Jesus. Let's go for a walk. Let's come over to my house. I want, to, I want to share some thoughts with you about faith. I want to answer questions that you have. And when they say yes, what if they say yes? Well, then you get a chance to do just that. And so your invitation should not be a bait and switch. Have you ever had someone say, we need to talk, and they don't say what it's about? Isn't that terrifying, right? You spend the next three hours sweating. Like, I don't know what we're going to talk about. Because usually those conversations are not like, hey, I, I won the lottery and I want to give you a million dollars. That's not usually how those go. Usually it's like, we got a new job and we're moving to Antarctica in the winter. And you're like, wait, what? The dentist called. You have five new cavities. No, right? And it's, let's talk, right? So pro tip, whenever you say let's talk, always tell people what you want to talk about. 
And when you want to talk about faith, and you say, come over to my house, let's talk. And say, hey, I want to talk about something awesome. And it's about God. And let, let's have that conversation. Our friends should know from our lives, our words, and our invitation, that the plan is to talk about God. We love the God we love with the people we love. They should know. They should know it so much that if they come to your house and you don't talk about God, they should feel like it was an insult. Because, hey, I can't help but sharing that God's design is perfect. Sin broke it. We've tried all kinds of things to fix it. But what we need is the gospel. And this can change your life. Have you accepted Jesus as your personal Savior? And when you follow Jesus, we pursue and recover that design. And I'm here to tell you about my faith because it would be an insult for me not to. Let's pray. Dear God, Heavenly Father, as we pursue these table talks, would you help us in our agenda, allow it to be clear, allow our lives to be the light for Jesus, allow our love for Jesus to overflow in our words. God, give us a boldness for our faith. Help us never to be ashamed of the gospel. And God, as we invite people to conversations about faith, help them to, to plainly see what we see every day. And that's the God of the world who died for them and wants to give them new and eternal life. We pray over these conversations that have happened and that will happen. And we ask God that your spirit would go before us, behind us, above us, and below us. That it would move through us in a powerful way. And God, that you would do only what you can do, save lives. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Hey guys, thanks for listening through that conversation today. And my prayer is that you'll be able to have powerful conversations in the days and weeks ahead where you can share your faith and see others come to faith. If that happens and someone comes to Christ because of your table talk, would you let us know? The best way you can do that is filling out your connection card anytime online at branchlife.church. We're there 24-7, and we would love to hear how God is using this series in your life. Don't forget to join us next time as we continue to have more conversation around the talk of the table.